seventh meditation of burial of Jesus. John 19, 38 through 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, bound it in stripes, strips of linen, with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. <clears throat> Jesus. Forever changing lives. He's changed mine, and he's changed yours. He's changed millions, if not billions, of lives over the last 2,000 plus years. And he's going to continue to do so until he comes back to reign as the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last, over the new heaven and the new earth, as Father Ed mentioned. But here in the sequence of events surrounding the burial of Jesus, we see two of the most unlikely people whose lives were changed by Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. <laughs> Jesus had been crucified. He's dead. One of three bodies hanging on crosses. The way things were done in those days, the Romans could deny the families of criminals the right to bury their dead, allowing the bodies to decompose for days as an example to other lawbreakers. Also, the bodies of those who were punished for high treason were treated even worse by being thrown on the ground for animals and birds to ravage. But as we read in the last meditation, the Jews, because it was the preparation day, knew that the body should not remain on the cross the next day, which was the Sabbath. So they asked that their legs be broken to hasten death. There's a question here. Where were Jesus' disciples? Where were they? They should have known what needed to be done, but they were nowhere to be found. They had run off, all except John. And in Luke's version of events, the woman, the women, excuse me, stood helplessly from a distance, just watching the events unfold. Everyone who should have cared would have feared for the worst to happen to Jesus' body. You couldn't just leave him hang there. But a surprising and I think spectacular thing happened. Two unlikely men who only knew Jesus in somewhat of a detached or, or detached observers, really, because they weren't disciples, did what can only be described as the right thing in a very courageous act. Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea and Nicodemus, known as the one who came to Jesus by night. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at each one of these guys. Joseph first. In our scripture, it says that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews. We'll come back to that. In the other gospel accounts, he's described differently. He's described as a prominent council member and a rich man. He is further described as a good and just man who has not consented to the council's decision and what was done to Jesus. He didn't agree with it. In Mark, it is said of Joseph that he was waiting for the kingdom of God and that it took courage. Listen, now. it took courage for him to ask Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission which suggests possibly a couple of things. One, that, that Pilate knew Joseph and the type of person he was. Or perhaps Pilate 
really didn't think the crucifixion of Jesus, this was mentioned a number of times today, really didn't think that this should have been done, that it wasn't right. And so he didn't want his body treated like that of a common criminal. Joseph's sole purpose was to take the body of Jesus by himself and do what was necessary. See, the other gospel accounts do not mention Nicodemus. There was seemingly no help to do this because of the fear of the Jews. The disciple John is the only one who uses the term fear of the Jews of all the four gospel writers. It's used before Jesus' death as in this way. No man spoke openly for fear of the Jews. And after his death, here in our reading, and in another place where the disciples met behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. Let's look at Nicodemus. The unbeliever who came by night. Our first glimpse of Nicodemus is in the third chapter of John. He had a prominent position as a Pharisee. He had power as a ruler of the Jews, as a member of the Sanhedrin, as well as a teacher. In fact, in John 3, he is called the teacher. He knew that something was missing in his life and knew that Jesus had come from God because of the miracles and what he had heard Jesus doing. This was about three years before the crucifixion. It would seem that at the end of the encounter with Jesus, Nicodemus left just as confused as he was before it occurred. Those of you who were here a few, few weeks ago when I preached on this, I said that as much, as I said as much because there was no evidence at that point to indicate anything else. But a year later, in the seventh chapter of John, we meet him again. When the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, who said to the officers, why have you not fought him? The officers answered, no, no man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered him, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd does not, that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search, look, for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. Shows you how much the Pharisees knew, because <laughs> Jesus didn't come from Galilee. The scene here is very simple. The hatred of the Pharisees towards Jesus is very evident. <clears throat> Yet we see Nicodemus taking a stand against his colleagues and spoke to them to be careful with their accusations against Jesus. Something is happening in the heart of Nicodemus. It's changing. He knew that there was something about this Jesus. And whether he thought at that point Jesus was the Messiah or whether... He was just convinced that Jesus had really come from God. I don't know. But he knew the Pharisees should not be talking about Jesus in the manner they did. And he had the courage to say so. Now in our scripture here, we see him completing a three-year journey. From one who had questions and couldn't seem to figure out this man called Jesus, to one who along with Joseph tended to the dead body of their Savior. Both of these Jews came out of the very council that had condemned Jesus. Both of these men knew that anyone who died on a cross, on a tree, was cursed. Both of these men knew that it was the evening of the highest religious feast their people celebrated. Both of these men knew that they were not to touch the body of a dead person because they would be unclean, according to the law, for seven days. They knew that they had about three hours before sundown to do the cleaning of the body, wrap him in linens with a hundred pounds of spices and carry him to the tomb. Basically, embalming Jesus was a lot of work for two men to do. It was a day of preparation and the Sabbath was about to come. It had to be according to the law. 
no halfway. It was rich man Joseph's own tomb, and it was brand new. It was carved out of rock, a new tomb where no man had ever been laid before. History says that those types of burials were burials for a king. You get it? Yet both of these men chose to do all of these things at great risk to their station in life, their wealth, and who knows, perhaps their lives, because they knew that everything that Jesus claimed was true. And every miracle and word he spoke was concrete evidence that he was the Messiah. And they put it all on the line. For Joseph, again, we don't know a lot about him to know how he had come to this point, except one thing, that he didn't agree with what the council wanted to do about Jesus. He had to have known about the miracles Jesus was doing and the things he was preaching, because that was known to everyone, especially the council. They were following Jesus' every word and movement because of the threat that the council felt from this man. But apparently Joseph was able to think for himself. He didn't just follow the crowd. He looked at the evidence and let that speak to him, even so that he had a heart conversion. And then let his actions speak for where his heart was. I've already pointed out the times in Scripture that we see Nicodemus. He had something else in common with Jesus aside from the work which they did together in preparing and burying Jesus. He also was not going to follow the crowd. He was going to find out for himself who this Jesus really was. But I submit to you that there was a defining moment when he knew. We don't see direct evidence of this, but one can look back at something Jesus said to him in his first encounter. And it wasn't necessarily John 3.16. Jesus said to him in John 3.14, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is he telling Nicodemus? Three years beforehand, he's telling him how he would die. He is telling Nicodemus that just as Moses lifted up the servant for the forgiveness and healing of the people, even so, Jesus as Messiah would also be lifted up for the forgiveness and healing of sin for all mankind. Being a good Jew, Nicodemus knew exactly what Jesus meant. He knew the only way for Jesus to be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness <coughs> is for Jesus to be crucified on the cross. Jesus told Nicodemus way ahead of time exactly what was going to happen and how he was going to die. And when Nicodemus saw Jesus' crucifixion, he knew that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. I believe also that when both Joseph and Nicodemus heard Jesus, Jesus say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, they both knew that this was the Son of God speaking. But here is the real thing. You see, these men did more than just believe. At a time when no one else would step forward, they did. Everything that said to them, don't do anything, walk away. But they did the most unlikely thing, get the most honorable and courageous thing. You see, the minute these men touched the body of Jesus and, st and stained their hands with his blood, it sealed their fate and their future. The very moment these men laid their hands on the dead body of Jesus, they said to the world, we believe that Jesus is God's Messiah, the Savior of the world. There's an old saying that says, actions speak louder than words. How loud are you and I speaking?